The lecture today is going to be dealing with a portion of a new test called the Advanced Stress and Hormone Profile, which uh, takes our regular stress and hormone profile and adds a very significant aspect to it, which is insulin, both fasting and non-fasting. And uh, what we're going to do is to look at the advanced stress and hormone profile, specifically looking at insulin, the fasting and non-fasting. And that is part of the metabolic profile portion of this advanced stress and hormone profile. The other aspects, the adrenal function, the sex hormones, melatonin, and SIG-A uh, make up the remainder of what we now call the advanced stress and hormone profile. In order to understand uh, the issue of insulin, we need to go back to the physiology and look at where insulin is produced. And insulin is produced in the islets of Langerhans. These are particular cells in the pancreas. They're called beta islet cells, and uh, they produce insulin, which, uh, as we know, is the major regulator of carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism. And insulin is crucial in a number of metabolic processes. It, is, it promotes glucose uptake and metabolism. That's what we're all familiar with. It also prevents glucose from being released by the liver. It enhances muscle cell uptake of amino acids to, to build structures within the cell. And at the same time, it inhibits fat breakdown and release. Uh, insulin uh, is released and is triggered by glucose uh, in the blood. That is the most important stimulator of insulin release. There, there's also somatotropin, which is also known as the growth hormone, and by glucagon. So if we look, therefore, at insulin biosynthesis, we need to understand that insulin is a peptide hormone it's secreted by the pancreas, and 50 or 60% of it is extracted by the liver before it even reaches the systemic circulation. And it has a half-life of four minutes. So within four minutes, half of whatever is in, in the body has already been neutralized. The function of insulin uh, is that it promotes glucose uptake. As I said earlier, uh, it is involved in glycogenesis, lipogenesis, that is the creation of fat, and protein synthesis in skeletal muscle and in fat tissue. So it is an all-enveloping uh, hormone. Its most important factor is in the regulation of blood glucose and creating a homeostasis of glucose in the blood. One of the things that you need to understand is how is it actually functioning with, uh, within the cell. And we know that uh, there is what's called the GLUT4. It is a particular glucose transporter, which sits on the membrane of cells, and uh, it will regulate how insulin will interact with the cell. So when insulin gets to the membrane uh, of the cell, it meets uh, a receptor for insulin, when that little lock and key is complete, then there is a signal within the cell to start producing these particular transporter uh, proteins, which come up to the membrane, open up and allow glucose to then enter the cell. So glucose cannot enter the cell without insulin having first begun the process of allowing the cell to uh, create GLUT4 and allow glucose in. So how does it really function? After a meal, what happens is that blood glucose levels immediately go up. This stimulates insulin to be released by the pancreas, and that stimulates the uptake and the storage of glucose in muscle, liver, 
in fat cells. And when that happens, glucose has been removed from the blood. It goes down to a normal range of blood glucose, which is what is being regulated. You want to regulate the amount of glucose in the blood. Several hours after a meal, the blood glucose level has dropped. And now glucagon, which is a storage form of glucose uh, in the liver, uh, it is released from the pancreas. It stimulates the liver to both break down glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose in the liver. Now you have glucose there. It is synthesized into new glucose. And that glucose from the liver is released into the blood again to be able to be utilized by the cells. So let's take a look at insulin resistance and what we call metabolic syndrome. Insulin resistance is a survival mechanism uh, in uh, many mammals, including humans. It's a way in which blood glucose is diminished or reduced in its uptake by muscle cells. They become resistant to the creation of an of glucose coming into the cell. Why? Because the body wants to shunt that glucose to the brain when there is a survival mode where you want to make sure that there's enough energy going to the brain and you want to decrease it going to the muscles. Well, that it is in a survival mode, but today it has become part of a major uh, chronic illness grouping, and in many cases, life-threatening issue for many people, especially those with obesity and related problems. In fact, so much so that it is called a fat storage condition. And what is known as metabolic syndrome clinically consists of a number of things. First of all, you have elevated fasting glucose. That is a cardinal sign of insulin resistance. Elevated triglycerides of these elevated fats, hyperlipidemia, elevated blood pressure, the low HDL cholesterol goes up, and there is obesity, specifically an increase in fat in the central or abdominal area of the body. That is coincident with an increase in uric acid as well as in salt retention which are cardinal signs of people with obesity. And it will lead inevitably to a whole series of diseases, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, fatty liver disease and cirrhosis, and of course, type two diabetes. That is a very large group of very dangerous diseases. And this increased risk of heart, kidney, liver disease, stroke, diabetes, as well as a whole number of other diseases, is what one sees in many people with what we call metabolic syndrome. Greater than 30% of U.S. adults and fully over 50% of those over the age of 60 will have some form of metabolic syndrome. In fact, over 88% of the population in the U.S. has at least one component of what I've just mentioned about metabolic syndrome. So it is a very prominent issue in the world and definitely in the US today. What about the effect of sleep? Well, sleep is essential for metabolic health. And we do know that there are a series of stages of sleep throughout the night and depths of sleep. We have REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep, and you see that in about 25% of the total sleep time in adults. Interestingly enough, in infants, uh, rapid eye movement sleep makes up over 50% of their time. And REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, increases in length as we get through the night. And the night is normally consisting of four or five cycles of sleep. Non-REM sleep, which is stage two, three, and four, represents about 75% per sleep, uh, a percent of sleep time in that four or five cycles every night. And it gets, the first two cycles are much deeper, and then you slowly start getting out of very 
deep sleep. Now, why is that important? Because it is an important time for restoring and repairing the body at the cellular level. Because what you're doing is you're maintaining the immune system's health, metabolic function health, and especially stage three and four, these deep areas of sleep are very important for the message for today, which is insulin, its creation and its use in regulating blood sugar. And what happens if there's insufficient sleep? Well, there are a whole number of issues, but today we are concentrating on the destabilization of glucose metabolism, this increase in insulin resistance, increased appetite and obesity, which goes hand in hand with insulin resistance and leading to increase in diabetes type two and in various types of cardiovascular disease. And so in the case of sleep and diabetes, what do we know? Well, we know that poor sleep affects diabetes both directly and indirectly, because what it does is it triggers a change to the hormones. It contributes to weight gain, to obesity. It causes changes to behavior and lifestyle. So a lack of good sleep can be very, very dangerous. In fact, sleep disruption is known to increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Those who suffer from type 2 are much more likely to have things like obstructive sleep apnea and other sleep disorders. And in fact, the more severe the sleep problems, the more severe and less controlled is the diabetes. So short sleep, if you're not getting enough sleep, it it's a very major risk in, in those who get older, as you get older in age, if there's insufficient sleep, you are more than twice more likely to be diagnosed with type two diabetes. That's quite interesting. So then that asks the question, what is diabetes? Diabetes mellitus, which is the name. It's a metabolic disease and it affects the amount of glucose in the blood because we know the body breaks down foods and, and liquids, drinks into simple sugars called glucose, which is a source of energy for the brain, for the muscles, for tissue cells. And if you have diabetes, it occurs when the body does one of two things. Either it doesn't make enough or can't make any insulin, that's type one diabetes, or later on in life, it can't effectively use that glucose. That's type two diabetes, which of course is much more prevalent. And if you're looking at these two types, there was a study in 2013, which showed that close to 400 million people have diabetes worldwide. And it's forecasted to become close to 600 million in uh, the next 10 years or a little bit more. That's an increase of 55% in a little over a decade. That's disastrous. So that early diagnosis and on-time treatment and continuous management is absolutely vital to a patient's life, the quality of life, and to avoid complications such as circulatory problems, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, and blindness. And by the way, in the US, 95% of the people who have diabetes are suffering from type two diabetes. So let's summarize then, type one diabetes is the result of an autoimmune response. The immune system is mistakenly attacking and it's destroying those pancreatic insulin producing beta cells. And when there's insufficient or no insulin, then the glucose can't enter the body cells, as I mentioned earlier. So the result is you get high levels of blood sugar, blood glucose in effect. In the case of type two diabetes, that is really a genetic and environmental factor. The body is producing enough insulin. However, for a number of reasons, it cannot effectively be used and it results in insulin resistance. So there's pre-diabetes, which then leads to type two, as the cells become more and more resistant to insulin. Again, the result, very much like type one diabetes, is that you have high levels 
of blood sugar. The shared symptoms of type 1 and type 2 diabetes are very well known. There's frequent urination. There is an excessive thirst and increased appetite. Fatigue, quite often immense fatigue, blurry vision, which gets worse and worse with age. The inability to heal if you have cuts or sores. These are all well-known cardinal signs of diabetes, either type. And as far as the insulin levels and how that relates to the clinical correlations, if you have elevated insulin levels, you get that with obesity, with hypoglycemia, because you've got too much insulin. It's just taking away too much glucose. Acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, the early stages of type 2 diabetes, and of course, insulin resistance, which I mentioned earlier. If you have decreased insulin levels, you get hyperglycemia. That's more glucose in the blood because there's not enough insulin, chronic pancreatitis, and type 2 and, and type 1 diabetes. And the causes of, of high fasting and non-fasting insulin? Well, for high fasting insulin, meaning you've been fasting, you haven't been eating or six, for six or eight hours, in obesity, you will see high fasting insulin levels in an inactive lifestyle. If you have a diet that's high in carbohydrates, you're producing a lot of glucose, you're going to get a lot of insulin to try to break it down. And the rest of this, as you see, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And with high non-fasting insulin, in a sense, just the opposite. There's insulin resistance. You will, you will see it in certain types of obesity, et cetera. If you take a look at blood sugar levels, uh, we do know that normal levels when it comes to fasting blood sugar is under 100 milligrams per deciliter. If you go to pre-diabetes, it goes up to about 125 and anything over that, you are in frank diabetes. For a glucose tolerance test in which you hit the body with a lot of glucose, you will see normally that, of course, the glucose will go up to a certain degree, up to about 140. It will go up to close to 200 for pre-diabetes and can be over 200 uh, with frank diabetes. So with all of that said, let's get to the issue of saliva. So what are the, the testing modalities for all of this, what is a, what are the prerequisites, the necessary prerequisites if you wanna use a particular medium uh, for testing? Well, first of all, there has to be the ability to procure the sample, to get that sample simply, to have it inexpensive, minimal discomfort. It has to be relatively specific as a biomarker because it has to somehow associate itself to that state of health or disease. And the technology, clearly needs to be accurate, it needs to be portable if it can be, it has to be easy to use so it can be used either for uh, diagnostic purposes or for health screening. For all of this, we know, and we've known for quite a while, that saliva, which is considered, quote, as the mirror of the body, is a biomedium that fulfills all of these three prerequisites. And if you look then at the correlation of blood and saliva glucose, there is a, a very strong linear correlation of glucose in blood and saliva. And this is in this one, it's for healthy subjects who were tested in a fasting state. And you see that these two correlate very well. So even though you can have highly individual uh, person-to-person -person results. Normally within a person, there's a good correlation between pre and two hours after glucose intake. So that leads us to believe that saliva can be an alternative, non-invasive diagnostic, or I should say screening method for diabetes. In this case, this comes from a paper by Zhang and Associates. If you're going to look for the effects of insulin, one of the things that you need to do is to test the body, to actually give it sort of an insulin stress test. 
And what, what you're doing is we're, we're giving them what's called a carbohydrate challenge test. Now, what is this? And you'll see on the right that there is a list of different types of breads and grains and fruits and starches that can be utilized to create 75 grams of carbohydrates. And those 75 grams are ingested as part of a meal that can contain fats and proteins. And what you normally do at a meal, usually lunch, you would eat those 75 grams together with whatever else you're eating. And then you take a saliva sample 60 minutes after the start of that meal. And what you're looking at is you're testing this carbohydrate challenge test to screen for insulin resistance. So you want to know how is the body responding to getting the 75 grams of carbohydrate? Well, how will you be looking at this? How is it going to correlate in blood and saliva? Well, in the case of salivary glucose, it reaches its peak level somewhere between 15 and 40 minutes after you've taken in uh, the food, in this particular case, the 75 grams of carbohydrate. And after the peak, it decreases until it's back to normal within three hours, it can be within two to three hours. And of course, the carbohydrate metabolism may be different to different individuals, and it may differ with the amount of food intake and the amount of days you're doing it. But in general, what's important here is that the salivary results and the blood results for glucose are in compliance. They, they will give you the same type of results. So when you're taking in food, the levels may differ with the type of food you're taking in. Or for example, if you're taking a 75 gram glucose beverage, not a carbohydrate solid food, but a beverage. With a beverage that's 75 grams, it's dissolved in water, that's going to go directly into saliva and blood and is going to give you a real hit. That's not what you necessarily want to take a look at. You want to see what happens when someone is eating normally with regular food that contains carbohydrates, meaning eventually sugar. And that's going to be the type of test that you want to do. So if you look at this, peak salivary glucose will give you a high correlation both in saliva and blood in healthy volunteers before and two hours after you've taken a 75 gram glucose containing beverage or solid food carbohydrate. What is the conclusion? There's a high feasibility to using saliva to analyze if you wanna use an alternative, non-invasive, convenient method for glucose monitoring in patients in this particular study who had diabetes, but also for patients who are healthy. So what is this correlation? Well, if you take a look on the left side, you're gonna see that if you wanna look at the correlation in normal range between saliva and serum, it is extremely correlative, absolutely. And that correlation continues into much, much higher levels of insulin in the serum and in saliva. But for the first large area of the normal range, they are absolutely in sync. And if you wanna take a look at saliva and serum insulin levels after you've given it that punch of carbohydrate, that oral glucose that goes in. If you look at the red here, that is what happens in the serum. You give it a challenge, there's an immediate increase in glucose insulin in the blood. In saliva, you're going to also get a very significant increase, but it's going to happen about a half an hour to 40 minutes later. That's okay. You need to know when to do the measurement. And that is true whether you're having low or high carbohydrate breakfast meals, lunch meals, etc. And this is a study uh, in 2017 by Miette Cote and uh, uh, other researchers, which show that whether it's in plasma, that's blood, or in saliva, whether people are normal weight or overweight, whether they're taking a low carbohydrate or high carbohydrate diet. If you look at saliva, it shows you clearly that there is a potential use 
in delineating low and high insulin levels, both in the fasting and in the non-fasting state following a mixed breakfast or for that matter, a lunch meal. So as far as reference ranges then, if you're looking at serum or saliva, you end up with some very reliable results. If you're looking at a fasting state, for serum, we know that it's normally less than 25 micro international units. And if you're looking at saliva, it's less than five. 60 minutes after you've given that carbohydrate stimulus test or the glucose challenge, you're going to see a much higher increase in blood and for that matter, in saliva. So whether it's in type two diabetes or for that matter, healthy individuals, it leads to a consistent increase in salivary glucose and in insulin. Now remember, salivary insulin concentrations can be up to 10 times lower than in serum. So you need to have a lab that knows how to test for these very low levels, but they are reliably there and you can see them if you know how to test for them. So that really supports saliva as a biomarker for type two diabetes. And here I'm showing you the bottom of a typical, a typical report that Fluids IQ gives. And for the advanced stress and hormone profile, I'm just looking at the bottom of a typical report where you will see insulin, both in the fasting state, that's morning after six to eight hours of fasting, or after a noon meal where there has been a carbohydrate stimulant stimulation test. In other words, the patient or the client, when they sent in the request form, they have actually checked off that they did the carbohydrate stimulation test and that they did fast for six or eight hours. If they did, then here are the reference ranges, normal, borderline, or elevated, both for fasting insulin in the morning or for non-fasting insulin in the noon level that is looked at. Just very quickly then to finish, cortisol and insulin, just to let you know that cortisol, which remember is also being looked at in the stress and hormone profile, cortisol is a potent insulin antagonistic hormone. It actually inhibits insulin secretion and it stimulates glucagon uh, secretion. It disrupts insulin signaling. So what ends up happening? It's inhibiting insulin release and it's going to induce the expression of a whole number of gluconogenic enzymes. So it increases hepatic glucose production and in muscles, it is going to reduce that GLUT4, that particular entity that is needed to allow glucose to get into the cells. Bottom line, it disrupts insulin. And so what is that connection? If you have normal levels of glucose, of cortisol, and you have an acute stress that happens, what does the body do? It prepares for fight or flight. Adrenal secrete cortisol that immediately taps into the stored protein in the liver. Why? Because you need glucose for the muscles because you want to run. And so it increases the glucose in the muscles. It inhibits insulin. It doesn't want you to store glucose. It wants you to get rid of it. As soon as that danger is passed, cortisol and epinephrine especially narrows the arteries, resolves the situation, and the hormones get back to their normal state. But what happens if there's chronic stress and there's elevated cortisol? Well, chronic stress, again, you tap in to the liver, to get more protein and the adrenals start to secrete cortisol, tremendous amounts because that stress continues. So that increases blood glucose. When that blood glucose goes up sufficiently and for a long enough period, it suppresses another hormone called adiponectin. And what that does is it decreases the normal ability for the cell to be sensitive to insulin. So the cell 
is inhibited from utilizing insulin and glucose can't get into the cell because the cell becomes insulin resistant. So there's more blood in the glucose. There's more glucose in blood that remains very high. The pancreas sees that and keeps overproducing insulin. And because of that, you end up eventually with diabetes type two, or at least definitely the possibility of that. So there is a definite relationship of chronic stress and glucose metabolism. Chronic stress through brain function will alter the way in which the body deals with stress. Chronic stress will induce changes in glucose metabolism, the development of insulin resistance, and an, an intolerance to glucose. And that is all the result of what's called allostatic regulation. The body adapts to this and tries to maintain a new type of homeostasis. It starts to produce different levels of cortisol, adrenaline, and other messengers, which ultimately lead to hyperglycemia. That means more glucose in the blood, insulin resistance, and ultimately type 2 diabetes. So with that, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for listening to that. That is the end of the session on fasting and non-fasting insulin, the meta metabolic profile portion of the advanced stress and hormone profile.